Hi and welcome to EDSE 457 Session 2 Part 2. This week we're covering literacies, identity, identities, and accountabilities and this lecture is on adolescent identities and literacy. So to get started, the objectives of this lecture are for you to be able to, by the end of the lecture, identify key statistical characteristics of American youth, identify some of the identity factors that impact American youth, discuss how different forms of literacy impact youth, and communicate how Common Core and this class fit into the work you'll do with youth in relation to literacy in your classroom. So let's go ahead and get started. Who are American youth or who are youth in the US statistically speaking? And these statistics are also found in the chapter one reading for this week. American youth are 14% um, and growing of the total US population in 2014 are the latest statistics that were cited in your book, but the number of youth in the US are growing. So it's a large number of the US population. Youth are also more racially and ethnically diverse than the U.S. adult population at large. So we have increasing diversity with the number of youth in our country. 24% of youth in the United States are first or second generation immigrants, meaning that they immigrated to this country or they have at least one parent that immigrated to this country. And 41% and growing are coming from um, households that have a low socioeconomic status. And 61% of Black and Latino youth uh, come from such households, 53% of immigrant youth. So even though there's great diversity among American youth, we are struggling with poverty among youth uh, nationwide. And that's especially important in California where we have very diverse student population. So a lot of diversity in our youth in America. So that gives us the demographics of youth, but who are American youth from an identity perspective? So adolescents are negotiating a developing sense of selves, self, both as individuals and as students. And what that means is they will need from you respect, engagement, acknowledgement of who they are, they're particularly vulnerable at this developmental stage to social influence and they really long for belonging, right? So it's really important. This is the adolescence is the time in students' lives where they shift from seeking adult approval to seeking peer group approval, uh, even to a greater degree. And when they relate to adults, they are looking more for guidance um, a lot. Um, of support rather than just uh, being told what to do. So a lot of wanting to be respected for what they do and what they know. And the personal identity factors that can influence uh, adolescents include the beginning of differentiation from their parents and thinking on one's own. That can lead to conflict in the home, sometimes in school as students branch out and become their own person. And this is also the time where issues of gender identity and sexual identity can be particularly pertinent for adolescents. Um, this is something especially to be aware of as a teacher, given the increased risk of LGBT Q plus or LGBTQIA students um, for suicidality, bullying, and self-harm. So this is something to be aware of in terms of the things that your students are dealing with. Another thing that I like to mention in terms of identity that's really important to consider is are the socio-political factors that might impact students, particularly as we noted, um, the high number of immigrant students in this country with um, changes in political status of immigrants. Um, this can really impact students themselves or their families and it's important to consider as we think about the social implications of various political things that are happening in our world that we also consider the impact of those on the identities of our students. U.S. youth, as I mentioned in the past slide, were also, are also culturally diverse and that cultural diversity impacts them in various ways. Um, it can impact their self-perceptions, um, how they see themselves reflected either in the curriculum or also in the teaching staff, whether they feel like there's a sense of belonging in school. 
or whether they see themselves as excluded from the curriculum and the perception of others, um, including teachers. And it's really important for us to know our students as individuals, but also recognize the ways that different cultures and different groups are perceived in society and challenge some of those stereo thinking outside of the box about our students as individuals, but being aware of the different cultural identities that they have to negotiate in the United States. Finally, students are linguistically diverse and language really impacts belonging in communities. So a lot of students will code switch or language switch um, between their home language and the language they speak at school. But it's not only about language, it's also about discourse. So you may hear students speaking in one way towards uh, their classmates or their friends and in a different way in class. But some students don't actually um, aren't actually aware of the implications of their language, particularly in an academic setting, and they won't code switch. And that can really lead to sense of belonging issues or uh, difficulty with academic language shifts and the um, implications of academic language. So it's important to help students to understand the connections between language and power um, and also the relationships between various discourse communities uh, and power. And we'll be talking about that more in class and throughout the semester. So when we think about who students are, this class is obviously focused on literacy. And so we want to think about what literacies really impact youth, both in and outside of the classroom. So starting inside the classroom, one of the types of literacy that we'll be covering significantly in this class is content area literacy. Content area literacy is important because many secondary students struggle with reading and need explicit strategies to access or engage with text. These strategies are part of what content area literacy are. So you might use a Venn diagram as we did in our first class to discuss similarities and differences between two people, two types of organisms, between equations and expressions in mathematics, or between two historical events or pieces of art. In this case, the strategy of the Venn diagram is one that you can take between content areas for the task of comparing and contrasting. And that's really what content area literacy is. It's focused on particular skills that are important across content areas and using reading strategies across these content areas to help students access the basic meaning of text and to give them structures of support that can be used in more than one context. That's different than disciplinary literacies. Um, disciplinary literacies are really important at the secondary level and as we move into post-secondary education. So particularly starting in high school, when we think about what it means to engage with disciplinary text, there are particular ways of knowing in one's field and ways that we express expertise. So some of the ways that we can access disciplinary literacies are thinking about the seminal texts in your field. And what I mean by seminal texts are not just things that are written, but what are things you have to make meaning of, right? So it could be an equation or a graph or a data table or a painting or a political cartoon or um, signs that a catcher might uh, give to a pitcher in order to tell them what type of pitch to throw. So there are different types of texts that we are interpreting and students have to have certain types of knowledge in order to understand and interpret these texts. And that's what disciplinary literacies are. They're related to your particular discipline and the ways in which students communicate knowledge in a way that's recognized by others and make meaning of um, core texts in the field. So in math, for example, it might mean strategies to promote the math practices, like asking questions to help students recognize patterns, for example. Or in art, it might mean using the art elements or principles of design to help students engage with a painting or a sculpture that they see and interpret meaning from that piece of art. Or in science, there might be specific ways to represent data that students need to be taught um, or how to write a hypothesis that promotes inquiry, that need explicit teaching that someone outside of your field couldn't really teach because they don't have that content understanding. And so disciplinary literacies are really specialized types of literacies inherent to one's field. 
both inside and outside of the classroom though students are really dealing with a lot of 21st century literacies and a lot of times when we hear the word 21st century or the words 21st century we think it's code for technology and while 21st century literacies do include technology-based literacy and digital literacy um, and those are an important part of 21st century literacies including skills around navigation of web browsers, websites, various forms of interactive media, web-based tools, hyperlinks. Um, that's all important, but 21st century literacies aren't exclusive or aren't, aren't only inclusive of digital literacies. 21st century literacies also encompass media and critical literacy skills, uh, the ability to express oneself using multiple modalities. So how do we make voice, visual, narrative, etc., all part of showing and communicating understanding. Um, and it includes things like the ability to demonstrate critical thinking and writing to a variety of audiences for a variety of purposes. So the other video this week talks a little bit about this and I wanted to in this part of the lecture quickly preview two forms of 21st century literacy that will be playing heavily into our course. The first is media literacy. Um, some people have already mentioned on the discussion boards the prevalence of media-based texts. So these include YouTube videos, audiobooks, um, advertisements, social media, and it's really important for us to think about how students make meaning of these texts and engage in producing these texts because there's a lot of impact of these types of texts in students' everyday lives and the ways in which they interact with the world and the ways in which their perspectives, students' perspectives and our own perspectives are shaped in the world. And so media literacy is an incredibly important part of 21st century literacy, but also the 21st century world. The other thing that I think is critical uh, is critical literacy and that involves both critical media literacy and critical textual literacy. So critical literacy really asks us to think about the messages behind and between the lines in text. So it asks us to think about whose voices are being heard, which perspectives are being represented or not represented, um, and how the different texts that we read reproduce specific ideas or power structures in society and how we can use these texts or our ways of communicating to take action in response to uh, the things that we're reading and learning. So it's easy for us to think about this in terms of historical, artistic texts or literary texts and interpretations. For example, whose history is being told or left out, whose um, history is being taught and tested or what types of literature are on standardized tests and what are not, um, what's in the canon of art and art history or literature, whose stories are included in the classroom. But in more insidious ways, it's around us in every content area. So how prominent are women scientists' contributions um, or are they recognized within the story of science? Or how does gender play out in mathematics word problems? These are important things for us to consider because again, when we think about identity and how identity gets reflected, we really want to help students make connection with our field. And if a student doesn't see themselves in our field, it's hard for them to make connections. And again, this is especially important in media texts. Right? So we think about whose story gets told in the media, how our culture is portrayed in the media, how are youth in general portrayed in the media, and how do different outlets represent the same event differently? How do these types of stories reproduce the challenge, reproduce and challenge power structures in education and society? So these are all important types of literacy that really impact adolescents, both in the classroom and outside of the classroom. Another thing that really heavily impacts adolescents um, is the Common Core and any type of standards or standardized testing. So the Common Core uh, is what our California standards are based on and they heavily influence standards outside of English language arts and math, um, even though there are separate standards for a lot of different content areas. Uh, there's a section of the English language arts standards that focuses not just on English language arts, but also on other content areas, um, but including literacy. 
right, in those content areas. And the high stakes testing really impacts the experience that students have in school. So Common Core recognizes that literacy isn't just in the domain of the English classroom. In fact, it advocates for domain-specific knowledge and domain-specific types of literacy, which are important in helping students to develop literacy in that discipline. It sees literacy and content knowledge as intertwined. Literacy can support students gaining more knowledge in a given discipline, and students need to have background knowledge and understanding in order to engage with certain types of text and disciplinary ways of knowing. So the Common Core emphasizes uh, the importance of meaning making and expressing one's thinking, particularly in writing because that's what's tested. But again, if you've looked at the Common Core tests or the SBAC test, there are texts that are multimodal. There are video and media texts, um, but a lot of the things that are tested are can you express your knowledge in written form? So how does this all relate to you and your work in teaching and this class? So in terms of your work teaching and this class's goals, I'm hoping that this class will be an opportunity for you, particularly in the in-class sessions, but also with the flipped videos and the readings to engage in content literacy strategies yourself and literacy-based activities that you can use in your free in your future classrooms or even in your field work for the course to support student understanding. I think literacy is a really important tool that can be used in all content areas in different forms to really help students get what it is that you're teaching. I hope that you'll begin developing connections both in terms of content area literacy and also disciplinary literacy. So developing connections between your disciplinary ways of knowing which are specific to your field and the literacy in your discipline. So how can students interpret text, whatever your texts are, whatever they need to make meaning of in your field, and how can they communicate that knowledge through the context of literacy? And finally, and probably most importantly, um, and the core of this lecture is that I hope you'll build bridges to youth through literate practices. So for me, literacy is such a powerful tool of connection and relationship building is one of the most critical elements of teaching, especially secondary teaching, as students are really looking for that sense of belonging and connection as they're negotiating that transition between childhood and adulthood. Students are really active agents who make choices about whether they're willing to learn from you um, in the classroom. And so I hope that this class will help you to gain some tools to support them in both wanting to learn from you and being able to learn from you. Thanks so much for watching this part of lecture. I look forward to seeing you in our next class.